Hey everybody, welcome back to the Spear Factor Spearfishing Podcast. Uh, today's very exciting guest and new sponsor, uh, Jerry from Neptonics. Jerry, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, hey guys, how's it going, man? Jerry, Neptonics. Um, been uh, part of Neptonics since 2014. Got into the spearfishing industry with Blue Water Sensations in 2004 and been free diving since I was about six years old. So a little over uh, 32 years of spearfishing now. Wow, that's a long time. How did you even get into diving at six? My dad still dive with him to the day, man. Like um, he loved it. Used to take me down to the Keys lobster and got into the whole thing with him. So your your dad has been um, diving for how long now? I mean, let's see. Um, my dad is seventy two now, and he started diving when he was fifteen. So I'm not sure on that math there. What is that? Fifty something years. Wow. What, what do you remember? Do you know what got him into it? Just man. Um, one of my, one of his friends, dad used to dive and, um, they would hang out all the time. And I guess just as kids or whatever. And his dad was, um, my dad's friend, Gerald Rojas was a commercial fisherman and would take the kids and they at, at 15 years old or whatever it was, he just started diving and helping on the boat. And within a few years was scuba diving and doing the commercial spearfishing thing. Wow. So that's interesting about from us being from the West coast to Florida, the commercial, uh, spearfishing thing, like mm -hmm. what do you, what are your thoughts on that? And I mean, have you heard the argument and all that stuff? People, man, I I've heard of, I've heard all the arguments. I do know a lot of the science. I do know some of the facts. I don't know all of it. I hear a lot of people's opinions. And at the end of the day, I, I think, I think commercial spearfishing and commercial fishing as a whole is fine as long as it's sustained and managed properly. Now, I think that's where the argument comes all in and the water gets kind of murky is no one really knows if it's being managed properly. Right. And then everybody's definition of sustainable seems to change depending on the climate as well. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But I mean, from a, from a recreational standpoint, I don't, I used to be bad about like shooting all the fish and, trying to sell it out or give it to neighbors and friends and just pulling the trigger as many times as I can. But now, man, I just, I just want a few fish for dinner and let the ocean be the refrigerator partly. Cause I think I'm getting older and lazy and don't want to cut them all up at the end of the day. So we just, I told, uh, we were talking uh, just before this about the last spearfishing trip I went on. And that was my whole argument to the other guys of, you know, the fishing was tough. And so certain dudes were just pulling the trigger on certain fish just to try and eat it. And I'm thinking like yeah. the whole time, I don't want to deal with this shit on the back end. Like if it's a shitty trip, I just want to get home and fillet a grouper or one fish or whatever it is, and then be done with it. But sure. I feel like that's a natural kind of progression with, as you get older, you start shooting less and less fish. I fully just, agree. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, right. I just, yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of rules. I'm not sure like the California side, like I know some of the laws and regulations there, but nothing like what um, a local would, but like, there's a lot of rules here that just make zero sense to me. Like, you know, just because you're allowed 10 fish in a day, doesn't mean you should shoot 10 fish in a day of that species. And then there's other species that we're not allowed to shoot as spear fishermen. And I can't figure out why a guy a hook and line can have 10 of them, but we're not allowed to shoot one of them. Like, just, there's like a uh, snook's a good example of that it's a slot fish. It's an inshore fish here. Um, Guys hook and line them. They target them. I think if I'm not mistaken, the slot's like 21 inches to 36 inches. And they're allowed like one per person during snook season, but we're not allowed to spearfish those. And I don't get that. Why? Like, it's just, it's, I mean, it's something that's above me and I don't understand how our government regulates that or why it works that way, but I'm sure someone who's really smart either has a really good explanation or no explanation at all. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the mistrust comes, like even out here. Sure. Um, you're having someone that's primarily just academia got their biology degree, whatever, and the knowledge is passed down. And then literally they're set based on measurements and sitting at a dock, getting their own measurements. And I could be like completely off base here. So, sure. <laughs> but it's like, no, that's, it, what I, that's what I was saying. Like when I was telling you at the beginning of this, like, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of people's opinions. Like there's not a lot of like facts backing all this up. Like, like, and one of the things that NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries does here, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, so National Marine Fisheries, not NOAA. 
one of the things they do here is they're like, well, we estimated the recreational sector took 10,000 pounds of this or a hundred thousand pounds of this species. I'm like, well, where the hell did you get that number at? Like, would you just pull that out of a hat? Like what, where, where'd that come from? Like, are you just like guessing like the fish's weights on Instagram on everyone who posted? And what about everyone who didn't? Yeah. I feel like there's no, but especially here with the limited um, wildlife, like fishing game and all that. And there's no funding for, I mean, it's minimal. And I'm sure Florida, I heard in Florida, there's, it's actually, there's quite a bit more fishing game guys run around game wardens or whatever, but I'm just kind of like, where, how, what is your Delta? What are you estimating? Are you taking a sample population and then times in it by whatever? And I think honestly, that's for me where I'm like, I don't really trust a whole lot of, I don't trust the accuracy I'll say of all of that stuff. I agree with that. I'm right there on your page with it. I don't trust it either. And then, you know, for whatever, for, and, and there's several reasons that I'm sure that spear fishermen as a whole, get a black eye about the whole sport but most of the guys and most of the women i know that go out there in their own boats and stuff like we're actually the people that are actually picking up trash off the bottom of the ocean floor and balloons that are floating around and stuff like that but none of that stuff gets credit which is is not a bad thing like no one's doing it for credit they're just doing it because the you know the ocean is their happy place and that's what that's the right thing to do yeah 100 percent on that i mean the other thing that's kind of funny is like you'll be out there out here, especially you'll be out of bluefin season trying to get, you know, limits bluefin is too, but you're out there trying to get your bluefin. Meanwhile, like a commercial signer boat pulls up and scoops up like a mile of tuna and then takes it across the border and puts the tuna pens. And you're like, well, that's okay. Brutal. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, that's, that's brutal. it's ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Um, you know, I understand I live in a community full of fishermen and commercial fishermen, but at same, it just got to make sense. I feel like to, to normal people, um, whatever the limits are, everybody. Yeah. I think for the most part, especially spear fishermen want to respect that. And, but they just want to know that it's actually being managed correctly, either good or bad, whatever it is, like whatever favor, I don't even care about the limits. Cause usually, like you said, you know, we shoot such few fish. I just need one and go home. And it gives me an excuse to go back later. Um, yeah. 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 I'm not but- trying to go home and like cut up fish for three hours and then vacuum seal it for another two hours and then freeze it. And then oh, fuck that man. Yeah. Especially if I got a wife, like you've been <laughs> fucking off all day long. Um, and now you're going to spend four hours. Uh, you got some shit to do. We got stuff to do, you know? So that's yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And then, and then, and then where it gets really ironic is then you're like, I'm going to go again on Friday. And you're like, well, my freezer's full. So that doesn't make any sense to do it that way. Right. And that, that's the other thing. Um, I know people, uh, places I've been, people are allowed to sell fish and that's always kind of controversial too. Um, and I had explained it to one of my friends. I was like, do you realize in Southern California, if they allowed us to sell fish, this place would be looted ridiculously. Like they're oh, now, terrible. yeah, the amount of, I mean, the amount of people out there pressuring the fish. And now you're saying that I could potentially go out there and get a tuna and get paid, um, you know, however much depending on what i catch like my wife would be like hey you need to are you going fishing you going fishing we need to put the kids in uh private school go fish you know what i mean like yeah turn into like and it makes sense yeah there's Mm -hmm. a whole nother thing to it too where it's like for us here we have the marine protected areas and uh and i'm you know i'm assuming florida has the same kind of stuff but it's like what are the what's the criteria for reopening these things or closing these things or 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 that's my big thing because right now I can tell you if there are certain areas, marine protected areas, if you opened it up, it would be an absolute massacre of these poor fish because they're like pets now and they would be wiped out. It, it would be. Yeah, it would be. I don't, I've always kind of thought there was like, um, like the, the marine parks are an amazing idea, but the one thing that I don't understand why is I think Belize does this. If my memory serves me right, is they make a section of the reef, a marine park. And then the like let's just say like hypothetically like 10 miles by 10 miles of that section is a marine park or maybe like 10 miles by two miles of it is right of coastline like where the reef is and then the next 10 miles is not and then the next 10 miles is so and then like every three years they rotate the opening and closing zones of the reef and i think that's a i don't know if that's a great system or not but it seems like a pretty logical system like right you know like if you know if you move like four miles of the coastline every year down the coastline and then reopen another four miles it'd be 
a really interesting scenario for California. Well, and I had heard, uh, I know in New Caledonia from a friend of mine that they do every other reef or every other high spot is a park. Okay. So they just rotate. Um, and so one particular area is not getting all the pressure. Um, so they do something. And how, like like how, how, how often do they open and close those there? Do you know, like, or rotate I, those high spots or reefs? Do you know? I don't know. All I know is from a friend that went there and he was like, you could tell that place is loaded with fish or whatever they're doing. It's working. Um, yeah, I don't know. I imagine it seems like it would be, on, it, it would be cool to be depending on, and I'm sure there's all the science depending on how fast the fish grow and all that, sure. how much of an impact that would make if you closed it for X amount of time or, you know what I mean? Uh, right. Yeah. But so not to change the subject, but to change the subject, neptonics. So <laughs> you've been free diving sure. since you were six. How did yes. you, was there a time where you, you've been diving your whole life? Was there a time where you're like, you know what, I'm going to put this thing in like afterburner mode and just go for it where you kind of took off with your own, your own personal little trip of spearfishing? No, not at all, man. Like, um, that's like, Oh, you mean from like a spearfishing standpoint? Is that yeah. Correct? Just spearfishing. Yeah. Yeah. So I was always like diving and lobstering and scalloping and it's kind of like spearfishing with pole spears as a kid. And then, um, always loved it. And then I think around like 14 or 15, my dad had a really, um, at the time it was like obnoxious. I hated it, but <laughs> Now looking back on it, it was probably one of the better things that ever could happen, right? And his his rule was pretty simple: like you can spearfish when you can load your own spear gun. That's and um, like I said, at, at the time it was like super annoying. So I got to dive with like one of those little fiberglass whatever pole spears, and I mean, I felt like I wounded fucking fish left and right versus putting fish in the boat with that thing. But damn, does it teach you to hunt right? You know, a hundred percent, yeah. But, um, you know, as, and I remember like I was a, as a kid, like, I don't know, probably 12 years old or 11 years old, I was pretty young and I'd come home from school and there was like the little, like, I want to tell you it was a JBL Explorer, a little tiny gun, like probably a little, like 16, 18 inch gun, little tiny, like boy looking thing. And every day I would come home and try to load this thing and load this thing. Cause the rule was, as soon as I could load it, I could go spearfish, right? And my dad never used the damn thing. I don't even know where it came from. And like, I, I don't know at whatever age it was, I came home and one day I was able to like load this thing. And now here I am like, you know, an 11 year old kid in the backyard with a loaded spear gun. <laughs> and what could I'm possibly like, okay, go well, wrong? Yeah. Right. So this sounds like a really, really fucking terrible idea, but you know, looking back at it, it was comical as hell. Like, so now I'm in like the backyard as this dipshit little kid wandering around and there's a lizard on the oak tree. And I'm like, Oh, I'm absolutely going to take that. And I remember <laughs> it was absolutely terrible. I remember this like yesterday. They say you can't remember pain, but it's absolute bullshit. Um, so I tried to shoot this damn lizard that's on the side of the oak tree. And I shoot this thing and the shaft flies out at a million miles an hour. And it hits the end of the shooting line, which is not long enough to get to the oak tree or the tree. So the lizard lives. And the spear comes back at me at, at another million miles an hour and hits me right in the tip of the dick. And I literally like, oh, oh my I'm, God. I'm I'm like an 11 year old kid in the fetal position in my parents' backyard, like screaming at my dad, like, why would you let me do this? Why would you let me do this? Like, and he walks outside and he's like, you fucking deserve it. And just walks back inside. And I'm like, yeah, fuck, fucking hell, man. Your dad sounds like my dad. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he's absolutely right. I absolutely did. <laughs> it's fucking comical. Oh man. I'm just laughing now. You got remembering like in my backyard doing dumb shit, shooting stuff. And like, I remember yeah. I was shooting a bow and I was like, oh, I really want to try to hit this up on the hill. And I like arched it up and I fired it and it went right in the fucking middle of our brand new basketball backboard. Oh, so shit. it was like a perfect thing. And my dad came out and fuck, I remember he's so pissed because he just spent like <laughs> all day, like concreting it, and, like get it on and just like snap the fucking bow in half. It was just pissed. Oh um, man. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, <laughs> That's comical, man. But, it's um, funny back growing up back when we were boys and allowed to be like rambunctious boys like yeah you want to figure it out you'll figure it out like yeah go ahead yeah exactly you're gonna figure it out not saying you're not gonna end up in the emergency room but you're gonna figure it out right but yeah pretty comical but um yeah i think i got really heavy into the spearfishing thing probably around 14 or 15 like just absolutely loved it joined the marines at 17 was a dive instructor in the marines 
um, got out of the Marines and then got into the whole competition spearfishing and would show up at tournaments. And like, you know, I had rife guns and Omir guns and all kinds of different things. And, you know, some guns would work right and work the way I wanted them to. And most of the guns that were very easy to dive deep weren't really powerful. And the ones that were really powerful were really hard to dive deep. So just started like tinkering with designs and making stuff and carving stuff and modifying stuff and worked with Daryl Wong a little bit to make a different gun and um, started making my own float lines. And then, you know, one thing just led to another with it, man. It just kind of, you know, next thing I know, it was like, I was at a tournament and I had like some custom spear guns that I made. And um, actually I did not make those. I had Hatch make those for me. And um, I was at one of these tournaments and um, someone's like, where'd you get that spear gun at? And I'm like, that's kind of a secret, man. Like, <laughs> that's how, that's like how I'm winning these damn things now is I finally got equipment that's doing what I want it to do. And the guy's like, no, I want to buy um, five of them from you. And I'm like, wait, what? And at the time I'm like, you know, I'm working at a vending machine company. I'm working at a bar part-time, I'm, you know, just hustling and doing everything I can to like pay rent and been kicked out of three apartments in my life to go on dive trips. Cause at that time, spearfishing was more important than more important than rent, which it still is actually. But <laughs> so there's that argument. But you know, so this guy's like at one of the tournaments. He's like, "Well, I'd like to buy five of these spear guns from you." And I'm like, "He's like, I want one for each of my boys. I got three boys, and I want two for myself." And I'm like, "Um, no, man, not really interested." Blah 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 blah. And he's like, "I'll give you five grand for five spear guns." And I'm like, "Wait, what?" I'm like, "That's more than I'm making in a month. Like, that sounds good." And it's kind of like making cookies, right? Like, you don't go in the, uh, the kitchen and dirty all that shit up to make a one cookie like you're making a batch so made 12 spear guns had seven left and kept one more of them for myself put the other six on ebay and sold those within a few days and i was like what the fuck is going on here just kind of worked that way so that's interesting so is that kind of what got you like the the i guess got you to think like maybe i could make a make a business doing this yeah. So that got me like on the right track with it, man. And it was still a little bit of a side hustle. It was just helping me afford to go diving and spearfishing. And then, you know, one thing led, led to another with it and just kept growing and growing. Yeah, so I, I, a lot of that, I, a lot of that I believe was just the timing of it, which was sheer dumb luck on my side. Like I had no idea. Like the spearfishing industry at the time was like very big, but there was no one making or selling custom gear really. Uh -huh. So I think that's where a big part of it is now. And now that, you know, now it's a really, I wouldn't say it's a giant market. It's still a very niche market, but there's several companies that make custom gear now. And, but that being said, there's, you know, thousands of divers now versus hundreds of divers. Right. It's, it's interesting what you were saying about hustling and working part-time job at a bar and all that. I was like, yep, that's exactly, I know that feeling exactly. Um, what did you do in the Marine Corps? How long were you in the Marine Corps? I was in the Marine Corps for uh, five years. I um, enlisted in 97 and I got out in 2002. Okay. Wow. They actually let yeah. you out. Um, yeah, so I got, um, I was supposed to get out September, uh, 15th of 2001 and I ended up getting extended, um, from the whole nine 11 thing and did an extra nine months. And so that, for that, so not quite five years. So that's, would be a little bit of a bullshit, but, um, four years, nine months. And that was that. What was your MOS or, um, um or originally I had joined, um, and I was 57 11, which was NBC nuclear biological and chemical. Okay. All right. No, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and then, then went to the whole water survival school, became a water survival instructor school, then went to dive school, was doing that along with NBC, along with swim pool school, the whole bit. Were you guys doing attached like, to, go ahead. Go, I was saying, were you guys doing all your training in Panama city where the combat diver school is? Uh, we did, we did that. And then uh, Naval weapon stations, Key West as well. And then um, I was stationed in Camp Lejeune and I was attached to a unit um, I don't know if the unit still exists. It was close to 20 years ago. It was a uh, SOTG, which was special operations training group. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever end up deploying or no? I did. Ended up going to Afghanistan. Oh, okay. Right after nine mm -hmm. 11 or right. Yeah. Right after nine 11. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. It's yeah. It's, it's funny for some of the listeners, I guess they probably don't have an idea what half those acronyms are, but, um, and that's why I was kind of spelled it out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting because I feel like there's, there's so many people around our age where it's like that same exact pattern of going in and then getting out and then kind of like, well, okay, I, I did that. Cool. Check. That's a chapter. Now what? 
uh fuck i guess yeah so. yeah it's really interesting trying to figure out this limbo i feel like when you're in this limbo and it's like i was working at a bar uh going to school and i'm like yeah yeah no 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 real plan on what you wanted to do or not do right like at right. least that was me no i had no plan um, i had a plan but, and I mean, it totally it, it, got it was, changed yeah it was really interesting like at 14 12 13 14 years old i all i knew is i wanted to go in the military and then went in the marines and I loved it. I loved the organization. I just knew I didn't want that for a career. It was like my whole like teenage childhood years. All I wanted to do was be in the military. And then when I was in the military, like two years into that, I'm like, that's not what I want for a life. I can't wait to get the fuck out of here. And then I got out and I, then I got out like a jackass and not like had zero plan of what I wanted to do. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, that dude, that's, I totally understand. It's funny because a lot of the younger guys, me as a civilian now and working with them when they get out mm -hmm. Um, I always tell them, Hey, just make sure don't get out. If you don't have a plan, because you're going to realize it is night and day different than the military. And you'll realize too, how much the military actually does for you. Like almost to a disservice sure. where like, you need taxes, go over there to do taxes. You need, you know, um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It was a, it was a shock. It was like, it was definitely a shock. And then also, uh, yeah, like you said about two years, I'm like, wait a second, the whole, like, I used to joke around, uh, my was the situation was a little different, but I used to joke around about all the ruck marching and everything. And I'm like, yeah. two years, I gotta, I think I figured out why we're like hardcore and infantry and why we always yell and get all fired up. I'm like, this fucking sucks. Like, we're trying to like basically fool ourselves into this is like, we're tough. I'm like, fuck being tough. I want to get in the Humvee with the signal dudes and like roll with them. Like, and they have a skill. <laughs> You know, that's what I was thinking. I was like, what am I going to do when I get out? Like, we're going to lead an assault on this retail store. And, uh, and again, yeah, no shit, I, right? I just was like, fuck, I, you know, like, oh man, those, those, uh, those you know, things. it's, it's funny, man. Like, cause like as a kid, like before, like being in the military, like one of the more interesting things was, is when I first got out, like, like it was just like a big chaotic mess. And I was just thinking to myself, like, holy shit, man, did the Marine Corps instill some discipline, like. You're telling me to be at work at like 9 p.m. at night and I'm there at 8 30, like, because I'm supposed to be like half an hour early to everything, or you're late in the Marines. Right. And like, there's like guys that are supposed to be there at nine and they're rolling in 9 15, 9 30. No one gives a shit. And I'm like, what the, the hell's going on here, man? Like, yeah, there's some definitely, uh, I didn't realize too. And I thought I realized how maybe how isolated I was growing up where I didn't. Um, and I had this conversation with my EOD friends that got out. He's like, uh, these guys don't even know each other's like personal family or like, there's no, the camaraderie yeah. just isn't there. Or the fact, like for me personally, I was like, did that person just fucking lie and stab me in the back? Like that just never would have happened. Cause I probably would have beat the shit out of you in the locker room and nobody would have said anything, yeah. you know what I mean? Exactly. But like in the regular world, the real world, that shit goes on. Not everybody has the same code or the same value system as for some reason, people that go in the military and get the shit beat out of themselves, like physically and all the stuff we, for some reason that attracts, there's a certain as fucked up as it is at times, <laughs> there's a certain group of people that do that, like a, a brotherhood or a sisterhood or whatever. I don't know. And again, maybe it's just the group that you're in within the military itself. Cause I feel like, I'm not stupid. I, I definitely feel like every group has their, their pros and cons, but I guess I was really fortunate not to have to deal with any of this shit until I was like in the civilian world. And it really caught me by surprise. I was not expecting that. Yeah. Mine too. And that was just like part of being young, like not a lot of time, like working as a kid, you know what I mean? Like I, I worked at Winn-Dixie for a little while and I worked at the Florida aquarium for a little while and I mean, those are just kind of bullshit jobs, bagging groceries and taking out the trash and cleaning up, you know, fish tanks and stuff like that. Right. Not, a, not a rocket science job, but holy shit, like I get out and or I, when I got out, I was like, this is this is what working in America is like. This is this is terrible. Like no, no wonder places go out of business so often, like there's no fucking leadership. And, and that's dude, you hit the nail on the head right there. Yeah, definitely. I didn't realize that there was a. Uh so much lack of basic leadership like mm -hmm. my dad i you know is uh i call him more frequently in the last i don't know five years to say hey thanks for this or that you know than i ever have in my life just because he he taught me 
you know, um, lead by example, number one, uh, take care of your, you know, he said this shit before I even went in the army or went to school or whatever. He's like, take care of your guys. Number one, I had some great NCOs too, that Mm -hmm. really were on point as far as, uh, things to do and, and, you know, lead by example. I mean, how many times, like, cause I was at the Academy and they were like, you're going to be officers, you're going to be in charge of everybody. So you got to be the best. Yeah. Cause these motherfuckers are going to test you. That's basically my interpretation. <laughs> like you got to stand in front of these guys and know like, Hey, I have no, you have way more qualifications than I do. You've been doing this shit a lot longer and I want to learn a lot from you guys. However, I'm going to give you everything I have and then some, and I want yeah. to inspire you guys so that, you want to fucking listen to what I say. Well, that's like, that's position. So what I've noticed now, and we're getting off the subject, I guess, but I noticed now in, yeah. uh, in the regular world, it's uh, authority, like by a position only, not like I would never follow you anywhere. As a matter of fact, I might catch you in a dark alley if I could, you know, yeah, no kidding. type of people. And I think maybe that's what leads a lot of people with backgrounds like us to a situation where we do our own shit and we try to do it the right way. And and for the most part, like rather than just joining the regular nine to fivers. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't know if I'm doing it the right way or not, but I like the way I'm doing it. So I I got that. (laughs) Yeah. I guess they just say doing it the right way is a little like uh, self-righteous, but like just doing it, what we think, you know? Yeah. I know. I know. I know the way I'm doing it is efficient. (laughs) Yeah. So so let's get, I got that. I got that going. Well, let's get into this a little bit though. So how did you go from uh, young Jerry spearfishing to now you had a dive shop or how did you even get into the whole dive industry thing? Yeah. So I was, um, I I, I was making like the spear guns and I was making my own float lines and stuff. And um, I was making stuff like at local machine shops and I was buying stuff from Josh at Neptonics in California. And um, he was buying stuff for me. here in florida through blue water sensations and um there was a trade show that was like rolling up and i want to say this was like 2013 time frame i believe it was 2013 time frame don't quote me on that though but um anyways like we um i was like i talked to him on the phone a few times and i'm like hey man you want to share a booth at this blue wild show and see how it goes and that was down in south florida i think sherry day was running it and i think I think she's going to have it again this year, maybe next with the whole COVID thing, kind of put a damper on it. But um, anyways, long story short, um, met Josh down there and, you know, he was basically doing a, the same thing I was doing in California, a little bit bigger of a version, maybe a little bit better of a cleaner version of it. And um, we kept buying and selling stuff and to each other. And we just having beers one night at the show. And we're like, Hey man, like you want to like merge these things together and just form a partnership and divide instead of like, fighting against this thing like divide and conquer it and and you know we shook hands on it and drew up some paperwork and you know two days later we merged it all together and made it happen Uh, that's awesome that's yeah that's that's very uh uh forward thinking of you guys i think too like ego putting ego aside and like okay i think too many times people are like i got a competition i gotta bury them i gotta bury them rather than you know man i mean I'm not saying it's impossible to do, but it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. I think you're one of the few that's actually been able to pull it off. Cause I've had shit blow up in my face too. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. I mean, it's all right. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I, I think at that, I think at that point too, like I loved it and I was, I loved what I was doing and it had grown to a point to where it was busy as hell, but not making enough money for me to support myself on it too. So a big portion of it was like, like I'm, it's either something either here has got to break and give and like make it better and more streamlined or I'm going to throw the talent in. Fuck it. Right. I can see so, that. Yeah. yeah and I think and like, I'm not sure of this for, I'm, like, I'm not a hundred percent sure of this, but I feel like Josh was at that same threshold of it too. Like, you know, I mean, I was having like where I was working 40, 45 hours a week with my regular job and I'm still working 40 hours a week with this thing part time and just a big mess, man. Yeah. I understand that for sure. Um, with you guys now, who does the manufacturing because i know some stuff is still in santa cruz and then some stuff yeah we we still have we still have a small footprint in santa cruz um we do all of our own triggers in-house all of our own um basically everything neptonics hardware is still made in-house and then 
everything like soft good wise is all made here in Florida at our local shop. Okay. All right. Or subbed out to, or subbed out to local other local shops. Okay. So you guys have like a machine shop up there and you're just cranking stuff we, out. We, yeah, we do. We have, um, it's a very small machine shop. We have a water jet machine. We have um, a mill machine. We have a lathe machine and um, you know, some grinders and drills and presses and folders and stuff like that. Uh, super cool. Yeah. I, but, I, imagine. I mean, it, it does everything we needed to do for the spearfishing world. I don't think I can make anything for a car very efficiently. <laughs> I imagine. I imagine uh, you guys go in there on a Saturday or Sunday and they're like, what can we make? All right. Or just come up with, yeah. I think the cool thing about that is you can come up with all kinds of prototypes and you have it right there in house. Yeah. That's been one of the things that's been um, really, really phenomenal with working with Josh with the whole Neptonics thing is, you know, we'll, we'll come up with an idea, but we can actually bring the idea to light within like a weekend. Okay. You know what it, I mean? Like we yes. I mean, get some materials, we can cut it out. We can do the prototyping and then, At that point, we get enough to see if this is a worthy item to sell. And at that point, we can either figure out to either keep making them ourselves or sub it out to a big machine shop to do it. Right. Depending on the amount of inventory. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. that's. I talked to somebody else about that that runs a manufacturing business. And they're like, I said, what is the difference with doing business here versus China? Like China when you are, you know, how much money are you saving? He's like, well, the fact is sometimes you may not save any money because when you're developing prototypes and stuff, you can do it all right here and you have more control rather exactly. than ordering some big thing and you get it and it's garbage. You know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We don't, there's nothing hardware wise that we have that comes out of China. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. There's some stuff that we have made in China that is nothing more than there's nowhere in America to make it. Uh huh. So if I had a way to make wetsuits in America, they'd be made here already. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm assuming what I've experienced is that there's, there's a few places. And I think in Thailand too, everybody makes the same wetsuits. It's the parameters of what you want when you make it, when you ask them, but the same, I guess the same shops create, the set of the wetsuits for like half the industry. I know like surfing industry, they do it all in Thailand. There's a big manufacturer down there that does it all. Right. Yeah. But I don't, I'm assuming it's the same for, uh, uh, spearfishing as well. Like in areas Yeah. I think there's like, I, I, there's probably only two or three wetsuit manufacturers that I know of and okay. for the free diving world. Right. So yeah. And then you got to order, you know, a thousand. I mean, there, there, there might, there might be four. I don't really know that for sure that there's only three that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, so. yeah, no. And then, so what's next with Neptonics? Like you've, you've merged the brand you've, we talked a little bit offline. You've got, so one thing that, like I said before to you, your, your website, for some reason, it's just aesthetically pleasing or whatever it is. It's so simple what was the key do you think to your success as far as making a functional and uh, pleasing website to a consumer? Man. So in my mind, when, when Josh and I were doing the website and um, I do all the website work now and maintain all of it, I would say 95% of it. Like I have a little bit of help with the marketing and the SEO side of it and stuff like that. But um when it's all said and done, man, like my mindset of a website was just something to be very simple and a very easy user experience. But my goal was with selling products was to not overwhelm customers with too many choices. So I kind of took it as like from a dive shop owner standpoint is to buy some different gear from different brands, try out their best stuff, their worst stuff, see what works, see what doesn't work. And then sell two or three of the best items of that and then try to eliminate the others. Okay. That makes sense. And um, I don't know if that's the best strategy still moving forward today because there's so many new brands and there's new choices. And some of those brands are really good. And some of it is just Instagram marketing at its finest that people want. But um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially when we built out that website, we just wanted to make a very simple user-friendly interface, products that we like, products that we, th we know works. Um, products that customers like and they they want and just make it a very easy user friendly experience so you can kind of see everything in your face versus like digging through these giant menus and 
trying to see what's what to what's where. I think when we were talking before, you had made a good point as far as like, if you got like 40 sets of fins, you know, what happens is you end up selling yourself out of gear or like you just are uh, missing sales or also. Yeah, I, I think you, I think you do, man. Like, and there's so many really good fins is like probably the most controversial product on the market that I can think of at the moment. Like it's more, it's more talked about than guns in the market. And, you know, there's so many people trying to make carbon fiber fins and trying to make composite fins and composite carbon fins and all, the list goes on and on. And, you know, there's a handful of companies that do it really, really well. And the end of the day, like, it's not realistic for a dive shop to stock 50 brands of fins. Right. Well, you know, do you and I mean, think... I, I, well, to me, to me, like, to yeah. me, like there's, there's two things that make a carbon fiber fin amazing. And half of them don't fit criteria one, which is the test of time and durability. Like, do you really want your carbon fiber fin breaking at 90 feet? It's fucking terrible. You right. want to be on your trip halfway around the world and the baggage grill has broke your fins. It's a terrible thing. So yeah, you might have these fins that perform outperform a certain brand, but if the durability is not there and it leaves you hanging or almost drowns you or something like that, then what good is that fin? Right. You know, yeah, and then, I, I can see that. so, I mean, I, I'll absolutely like sacrifice like performance, like, and bring down a performance from a 10 down to an eight to have a durability at a 10. Yeah, and that's so, just my personal observation and my personal opinion. Like, doesn't make me right, but in in my mind, it's it's a really good thing. What what brands do you sell on Nectonics? So we sell Divars, we sell GFTs, which is my personal favorite. Those are the fins I use. Um, we sell the Penetrator fins, another amazing, really really nice fin, and then we sell Spearmaster fins, and then our plastic fins. We have um we have a handful of other brands in there, but um they're not bad brands. They're they're I don't think, I think they're amazing for free diving. I don't think they're amazing for spearfishing. And I think a lot of guys kind of mix up the two there. Yeah. So, and I've noticed that as well too. Now this is coming from someone that wore plastic for like 15 years, but sure. <laughs> um, what do you think is the angle? I've heard the angle if you're hunting on the surface, if you're doing deep I think, drops. I think I think the angle the angle has a lot to do with it. I think the stiffness has a lot to do with it. I think I think the the, the stiffness is the primary one. Like right, like you know, most free dive instructors, and I'm not I'm not saying all of them, but most free dive instructors think that soft is better because it gives you the proper kicking technique, and that is very very true until you're trying to stop a 70 pound fish from going in the cave. Right. And now your fins don't really work the way they're supposed to. So there's a little bit of a problem there. Right. Or um, you're, or you're trapped in a, in a strong current or something like that, where you need to. Yeah. So, so then the next step is, is like, you know, you know, your practice soft fins are probably amazing when you're up and down a line and you're practicing this perfect static environment and everything is, nice and calm and collective like it's supposed to but all of a sudden now you're in a two knot current you're fighting surf you're fighting swell and you have a 50 pound fish on the end of your spear like good luck making that soft horsepower work out right for you right <laughs> so and then the other thing that i see very 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 commonly is a 230 pound guy that's very physically fit is in a dive shop and they sell him soft fins like soft fins for a 230 pound guy who's fit is not the right fin and then it goes the opposite direction. Like that guy probably needs mediums and possibly hards. And then the flip side of that argument goes into is you have a 165 pound guy who's lean as fuck. He's fit as fuck. And he's an absolute animal. His hard fins are not the right fins for that guy. Like it's going to absolutely wear him out. Uh-huh. Right. So it's just kind of an interesting scenario there. Like it's just basic body mechanics 101 that a lot of people just overlook. Yeah. And I think the key thing there is to being in shape because that changes everything. A lot of people, it absolutely that, does. I remember doing a lot of swimming for, uh, finning and stuff for the military or whatever it was. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're not in shape, your ankles, your feet, everything. Yeah. You could swim real fast with fins on, but you will be smoked, especially absolutely. with those old jet fins that weigh like five pounds each. Like you'll be smoked so fast. Those things will make a man out of you. <laughs> yeah. I've worn those really for will. a long time. Yeah, me too, man. Those things are uh, those things are tough. Yeah, doing flutter kicks with those things on. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, no, it's interesting. So, what do you think? 
it, it, now, as far as Neptonics goes, what do you mm -hmm. think the things that are going to be to continue to have Neptonics grow? And um, like, do you have any projects you're working on or different directions? Yeah, yeah, we, we have a few projects that we're working on. We're working with some different materials um, on trying to make wetsuits a little bit more flexible and more durable at the same time. Um, so we, we've been working back and forth with that. We're working on um, we're working on a couple new trigger designs, um, just a handful of small things. But um, at the end of the day, man, like all my goal is, is just to try to take care of the customer and provide good quality products in a timely manner. And hopefully the, the hopefully the customers will take care of us back. Nice. Yeah, that's a good that's the, those are beautiful goals. That's important. <laughs> yeah, I think I think if I can manage that, like hopefully the rest will take care of itself. Right. So uh, here's one thing I, I feel like I know this think about this if it ain't broke why fix it like as far as you're talking about your triggers and i know your triggers well because i've ordered a few of them um mm -hmm. you've got your reverse trigger mech you've got your uh tuna mech which is nice because it's rounded off so you don't have to chip or do sure. any of that stuff which is that was the simplest thing it's so helpful i was like yeah you made a few guns um, sure and then you've got your standard uh let's see your standard um just standard regular reef mech um what else like with those things working the way that they do how do you improve upon that so we're not going to stop making those those are just tried and true designs that work very well but we're, we're definitely working on a reverse tuna mech it's kind of one of our objects there like a rounder a round mech that's very easy to install that reverse mech with the built-in line anchor um just just some stuff like that just to make it a little bit simpler for some gun builders and the customer, the user experience. So for the people that don't know reverse mech, we start throwing these terms out. Can you sure. explain the benefits of a reverse mech for? So, so the biggest benefit to the reverse mech, number one, first and foremost, hands down is the installation. Like it's a lot easier for the very new gun builder to install that and build that into his gun. There's the line releases built into it. You don't have to like these really tight tolerances. You don't have to worry about the wood swelling and shifting and making the line release bind up into the sear. So that is number one where the reverse mech wins on that. Um, number two on it is, is it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it does give you like two and a half more inches of band pull, which is not a big deal on one band gun, but none of us shoot one band guns anymore. So most of us are shooting two and three bands, which essentially is adding six inches of band pull on the gun, which is can be very beneficial. And then the argument comes into, well, your shaft is shorter so your shaft is lighter, but if you do the math right and you buy a shaft that's two inches longer, you now have the equal right shaft with the right weight. So there's there's a whole bunch of arguments and science behind it. And, you know, at the end of the day, you start kind of splitting hairs with that shit too, you know? Right. I mean, like, I mean, if honestly, if you <laughs> did not hit your, if you did not get your fish because your shaft was an ounce light, you probably were too fucking far away. <laughs> right. So that's the conversation I have too, because I love the uh, reverse mix as well because the extra you know the extra you can squeeze sure. every inch out of you know say a small hole gun or whatever it is you can squeeze every every little inch yeah of course it. but at some point it's like diminishing return where we talk about it it, like it, where it really is i'm like well it, it can be like on a very small gun or a one band gun like you'll notice a little bit of a difference but not a lot but on the on a long gun like a 60 65 inch gun with three to four bands like it's dramatically different right yeah, and I agree because, like you said, it's all it adds up. It exponentially adds up, and sure. then I mean, it's just compounding interest at that point, right? And my other thing is like I've done this before. Where I've missed a fish because well, I hit it or, or just didn't have enough power, and I'm like, I'd never want to be in that situation again. Yeah, I'm for going sure. to fucking overbuild everything so that yeah. if I pull the trigger, I know that if it doesn't land, it's on me. Like I didn't hit it in the right spot. I didn't hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that's where people really want to be when they buy gear. I think you guys do that really well, but for a while there's other brands and things out there like that are cutting corners and a big fish will expose that in a matter of seconds, if not less than a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Like I know this will probably sell, sound like a sales pitch, but it's absolutely not like I don't, get the logic from any person's standpoint that wants to buy a cheaper trigger. That just sounds like a terrible idea to hurt yourself or someone else. 
Um, but, but all that being said, like, it's a pain in the ass when your gear and your equipment doesn't work right off of a shore dive, let alone on a boat dive. It's, it's maddening. But if you're on an international trip somewhere and you decided to buy the cheap stuff, but you're on a $4,000 dive trip somewhere, like that's kind of weird. Right. Like at some point, like you spend all that money, all that time, all the vacation time, like some guys need permission from the wives. Some guys just are single and they go for it. Like, you know, time off of work, like the whole bit, like all the effort and energy that goes in there, the 50 phone calls back and forth to charter captains and guides and buddies and lining all this stuff up and the right dates and all this shit. Like to go over there and get let down by gears is that doesn't make any sense, man. That's kind of foolish. Yeah. And then the other side to that too is uh being ready, dive ready, being able to yeah. I mean I, I I talk about this on many things. It's like when you get your opportunity, say for surfing when I was growing up surfing and, and surfing, it's like, oh I will you know you put all this time and effort to go find all these mystery waves and you better have a right board. And you better also, you know, shocking, you better be in shape and ready to go because we're surfing, just like fishing, you only get a window every so often and you got to drop everything kind of go sometimes. And I think Mm -hmm. about with fishing now too, where it's like, everybody's buying this expensive gear, cool, buy expensive gear, but do you have the knowledge and the experience, um, which experience is funny because it's like something you know, I just heard somebody say experience is something you get when you, right after you needed it, you know? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Do you have all those <laughs> things in, in place? Like people spend mm-hmm. $2,000 on equipment and have no idea what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Know? It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And that works that way. And you know what else is pretty interesting too, is just because it costs more, doesn't make it better. Right. Like, oh, it, I mean, that's like, like, that's, that's kind of another, another big misleading concept that floats around the diving world too. It's like, well, this is, you know, this mask is $120. It's gotta be a better mask. Like if it doesn't fit your face, it's not better. Damn it. Right. Yeah. Like, the other thing it's like, you do realize the manufacturer that dude that's names on it, that he signed, like he has to pay that guy a portion of it and he's got to yeah. do this and that. So that's what you're yeah. paying for. Um, yeah, like, yeah, like in, my, in, my, mind, in and... my mind, like the best foot pocket is the one that fits you right. Like the best, the best wetsuit is the one that fits you right. The best mask is the one that fits you right. Like, it doesn't matter whose names on it necessarily. Yeah, it's really incredible too to think um, the amount of some of the stuff I've seen that's like we sell things as oh, this is the absolute, this is the best. If you don't have this set up, you're going to lose fish. And a lot of that's really good marketing. And a lot of that's total bullshit. Like you're yeah. talking about bungees. We're talking about the different materials. People make bungees. Let's talk about bungees for a second. Like sure. Norprene versus reactive, like all the different stuff. Sure. Having made my own gear, like you're talking about too. What I learned a lot of is that something that applies breaks over time and doesn't want mm-hmm. to put pressure back on the fish. Right like some other manufacturers has a ton of pressure because it wants the snap back. But then the flip side of that is you apply this pressure on this large fish over time. And then it takes an hour for it to contract back. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you guys do that? Cause I, I, I've seen your, your bungee. That's about half the price of some of the others, but yet it seems pretty on point. Yeah. So we, uh, the rubber that we made is we literally went to a rubber factory and have them make it for us. It's like literally custom made our specs, our outside diameter wall thickness to inside diameter. We built it around so we could pull 1500 pound specter through the inside and splice it and do the whole bit there. Um, but we just used, um, we custom made it with UV inhibitors. So it's got the right barometer in it. But most importantly, where a lot of bungees in my mind, they get it wrong is, is let's just say you're using an ocean hunter, three atmosphere float or a rife three atmosphere float. And those float hundred pounds at what point should your bungee take more than a hundred pounds on a certified scale to stretch it. Right. So at some, at some point, like you're fighting the, the bungee and the bungee is now fighting your float and not the other way around. So there should be like a really nice safety net in there of around 25% less than the floats you're using. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. That's true though. Yeah. So like if you have a bungee that is, let's just say hypothetically it takes 120 pounds to open up the budgie's never fighting that fish properly like at some point now your buoy just goes underwater which sounds like a really good idea and you do need it to go underwater that's part of the whole drag system that 
would be nothing different than a big marlin rig right that they're using but at some point the, you need it to slow down the fish to the right amount to where it doesn't hit a brick wall, but the float can still go underwater and not the other way around, not to where the fish is basically just on a static line. And sometimes that's what a direct float line is for over a bungee. But like, it, it should be stopping like a little bit less of your float's pressure, your float's buoyancy, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the questions, speaking of gear, one of the questions we had, um, I got from a from a gentleman, um, he said, with your, do you still, when you, tra- uh, and I know you talked to Shrek and did the travel thing, when you pack your sure. stuff in your bag, do you still yes. use bubble wrap or do you I just, do not. You, go, you don't, okay, I cool. Don't. I don't, yeah. So with my spear guns, I like all of my spear guns have that AR handle on them. And I just, I unscrew my grip. I put an Allen key in the, in my dive bag and I just take that off. So they pack a little bit cleaner and I don't have to worry about like something torquing that grip and popping like the, the pins or the teak in the back or something like that, or popping set screws out. Okay. That's a good idea. But yeah. I, I just do that just to keep it slim. And I obviously take the shafts out of the, the gun. So the same thing doesn't happen. If it goes on a conveyor belt and it gets smushed by another bag, the track doesn't get broken by the shaft or, you know what I mean? Right. Right. And it's kind of saves length. Yeah. But, I, but as far as like packing with bubble wrap, you could absolutely do that. Like personally, like when I travel, like I've always got like a couple of those, microfiber towels with me a beach towel my wetsuit and i just like very loosely lay the, the towel in that between my guns on my okay. gun bag and that's and all that gear has got to go with me anyway so it just saves me some space and makes it a bit easier for me yeah that's exactly what i do i wrap like one towel around the stock of my gun just because yep. i got to take a towel anyway so exactly um do you prefer using dyneema or cable or just it depends on what you're going for it depends on what i'm shooting i'm a huge fan of cable for dog tooth tuna yellowfin tuna bluefin tuna i'm a huge fan of dyneema for everything else why cable for yellowfin bluefin and dog tooth obviously doggies the sharks i'm assuming doggies doggies the sharks um and just the duration of the battle and the strength of the fish so underneath pound rateages this all makes perfectly good sense like well dyneema is a thousand pounds and the cable is only 480 and that's that's all very accurate right so where people forget is the burr that is in the hole of the shaft where you tie your line through the to your to your fin tab right when you shoot a yellow fin tuna a big yellow fin tuna let's say and when i mean a big yellow fin tuna we're going to say one over 200 pounds that battle, if you don't hurt that fish bad, can be well over two hours. There's so much risk for just simple abrasion of that smooth, smoothed out metal. And maybe there is a burr on it or a rough edge on it where it can actually cut that dyneema where steel cable doesn't break there. Right. So that's that, in my opinion, that's where steel cable still wins on those giant pelagic fish. I have just recently, uh, like I said, I went on that trip and the night before I inspected the eye hole on all the, you know, the through hole on all those mm-hmm. things, because you're exactly right. Um, that one would have cut of the big grouper or anything that would have sure. cut immediately. Just yeah. so I try to sand them out and run a file and try to smooth them out as best I can for that reason. Yeah. Another thing you can do too is um, that works really well is sometimes they'll show up at the shop like that where they just didn't get deburred properly or whatever happened and you can take a piece of the bear cable like um call it 20 inches long and crimp two loops on each end and just put like a wishbone uh tool through one end or a screwdriver through each end and you can actually use that as like a file to kind of soften it up in there too right i recommend that for everybody's stuff too because you just never know yeah um yeah what- so uh most most of this like, like it doesn't happen a lot but like the the difference of it is is on on a small reef fish under 20 pounds it's not going to put enough torque for that to be a problem but when you, when you shoot a big 200 pound fish or a big hundred pound doggy or big bluefin, like just the battle so long. And there's so much back pressure with like the big bungee and the bungee creates a lot of drag in the water. And you got one or two of these big floats. And when that's all said and done, that's just a lot of torque and a lot of back pressure for a long duration. The Dyneema is just, it's, you know, it's labeled as, as steel, but it's not steel. Like steel doesn't cut yeah. very easily. And all Dyneema is not the same. That's for sure. Exactly right. Yeah, like I mean, like now you have hollow braid dyneema and you have jacketed dyneema and you have poly jacketed dyneema. So it's like it's and then there's spectra and dyneema, which is then that gets really confusing for a lot of guys. But I mean it's all really good material. I just personally don't think it's great for big pelagics. Right. That makes sense. Um 
So how about, what do you think, what are your thoughts as far as slip tips versus double floppers? Cause I've heard both for doggies. Um, I go back and Ooh. forth about slip tips myself. Man, I, I love slip tips for those, for the big pelagics like that. Um, that being said, I've only landed one good doggy and I've shot a bunch and I've had bad luck with both, man. I think doggy is just that double fish and that's all there is to it, man. Um, but that being said, like I'm, I, I personally like slip tips better for doggies, but I also have shot a lot of doggies, but I have not had a lot of success landing doggies. You're not the only one. I think everybody that's ever hunted. Them, yeah. I think people, you know, we have said, uh, two out of 10 probably land. People don't, I was talking to Chris Coates about that. He said the same thing. Yeah. I, I, I feel, I feel like that ratio is pretty accurate. I've shot, I was in Latham Island last year, diving in Africa. And, um, I think I shot six and six, very, very good shots and lost six. How big and, were they? I mean, um, you know, they, they were ranging all over the place. The smaller one I shot was probably like a 50 pounder and, um, he it was just a bad shot. He got off, but, um, all the other ones were over a hundred, well over a hundred pounders. Yeah. And then one of them, one of them, it was a, it was an absolute monster. Like I'm quite confident and don't feel like I'd be exaggerating at all to say it was over 180 pounds. And I mean, I shot him pretty deep. I was probably 90 ish feet when I shot him. And by the time I got to the surface, all three of my three atmosphere floats were just buried, like just gone. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. uh, it's the most humbling thing I've ever seen. I thought bluefin were strong until I shot a 50 pound dog or a 70 pound doggy, whatever. Yeah. And it took a giant dive bar float down like nothing ever. I'm yeah. Like, I don't think I've shot a bluefin that would do that. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. And I think, I think also too, like where it's the doggies start breaking a lot of rules are, is they're soft like Wahoo, uh-huh. but they're more power, but they're more powerful than tuna, but they want to rock up like a snapper or like a grouper. Right. So you start having to like, like if that fish just swam and ran like a Wahoo or ran like a ran, like a tuna would, like we would all be in a consensus that, you could probably just use slip tips and be fine with this, but being that it's such a soft fish, you need something that hurts it where it can't, where it can't rip off as easy, but you're not using bungees. Like you need to be using bungees to take all that shock out. You're like trying to tether this thing to the surface so it doesn't rock up on you. So you're everything that you know about like putting drag and putting pressure against a fish, like kind of got to break those rules with that fish. It's, it, it's totally accurate because uh, I was using one time a 50 foot bungee hunting in deep. And I was thinking that, it at least put the brakes on, but still not going to be able to allow that thing to get to the reef. And it's a bungee mm-hmm. that I made. I was like, if I just shred this bungee, then, oh, well, I know I've got like hundred, you know, 600 yeah. pound dime in this thing. But yeah. Um, yeah, that thing grabbed that float and was just like later, bitch. I mean, like, it's fucking crazy, man. It's it. Cause it doesn't make sense. Cause you're looking at all the fish you shot and it's like, it's not that big. But like, it's, I feel like, and I don't know what I noticed was that that first run is like nothing ever. And then if it, if you can hang on after that thing runs, when you start bringing that thing up, it's over, but that thing. Yeah. I, I fully agree with that. But surviving that first run is, is definitely the, the, the coin toss, right? Like I feel like dog tooth tuna from a personal standpoint is about 70% your diving ability and your timing and your location, right? Like, I feel like that's very right. fair. And I feel like the other 20% of it is, is your attention to detail on your gear. Like most guys that are going after that, they know all the stories and they put all the details into the gear and they're using the right equipment. They've tested their guns. So they got all that going for them. And then you just need the 10% luck and that's all there is to it. Like, Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've, I've used a double flopper and landed them. I used a slip tip and landed them. I used, um, Chris Coates swears by the double flopper though, because he's like, sure. I've seen slip tips fold in half. And yep. the other argument that I've heard too, which I have seen personally is with the slip tip, the, you might stone them, uh, you might spine them or whatever. And the minute that slip tips engaged, that thing wakes up because now you've taken the pressure off the spine and yep. it takes off. Or like, I know guys that have like thrown fish in the boat. Like when you throw a fish in the boat and as soon as you take out the shaft, the thing wakes up. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, like for lack of a better term, the nerves reconnect temporarily, right? Right. Yeah. I, I, I've shot an 80 pounder, I think about 80 pounds with a double flopper and it ended up ripping one of the floppers off. I, I was going to say that next. Like I, I was like, I've 
I've seen what I've seen what Chris Coates is talking about where the flopper or the slip tips fold. And I've also seen the f- double floppers like shear off or fold back 90 degrees the wrong way. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like camp, like my friend Cam, um, he swears by double floppers for doggies. Um, my friend Pete that I dive with and I dive with Cam a lot. Both of those guys, they're on complete different opposite spectrums and they both shot and landed 20 big doggies. So like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of it just comes into preference too. I, what I, don't, I do the manufacturers what I do think, too maybe of the shafts like how they absolutely and i think another thing too which comes down to i think what in my mind is you got to spend a lot of time in blue water you got to spend a lot of time with the gun you're using and you got to be able to put good hold shots period and i think that's where a lot of guys like they constantly hunt the reef like or they constantly hunt the kelp bed and they're using their 125 or their 130 or whatever it is and they use that gun nine or 10 months out of the year on all their dive trips. And they've got so much trigger time with that fucking gun. And they're amazing with it. And they stone so many of their fish and they land so many of their fish. But now we're going to go on the dog tooth tuna trip or the yellowfin tuna trip or the bluefin tuna trip. And out comes the big gun that gets used twice a year. And it might get four trigger pulls a year and no shit. We don't hit it right. 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 No, I, you know, I mean, that's just, yeah, I mean, I I, I'm saying. guilty of, I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it, but I think it's kind of interesting. Like, of how many people forget that yeah i i yeah i i find the more guns i get the ones that were my go-to seem to take a back st- seed and then you know you're oh, right. yeah man trust me i know i got a shop with over 400 spear guns in it and i've got 18 of my own personal guns and i tend to use the same three yeah <laughs> and i don't even have an I have, I have a reason for you why i use the same three because i'm comfortable with them and they're reliable right and it's funny because uh, n- number one for me is, is it nice to dive with? Number two, can I hit what I'm aiming? And if I can hit what yeah. I'm aiming, then I'm, I'm good. You know, uh, also the exactly. conditions, like if I, if I have a shorter gun that just is a laser up until about 10 feet, you know, then I'll use that in the bad viz days. But, you know, when we go blue water, then I have my go-to double roller that I use every time. It might yep. be an overkill for a 20 pound yellowtail, but I can, put it right in that thing's eyeball but exactly if a 100 pound you know 200 pound tuna swims in front of me like i got feel pretty confident i can hit that as well sure yeah so um yeah for for blue water for blue water trips man i don't think i've ever like complained about being overpowered in a blue water trip yeah i i for years i had one gun i joke around about it i shot this gigantic gun that i made 20 years ago because i didn't know uh it was like, go for sea bass. So I made this gun. And then I, by default of that, I was very selective of what I shot because I didn't want to fucking deal sure. with loading this <laughs> five bands. I, I know all about it, man. Yeah. And then, uh, but I mean, if anything, well, my wife made a joke when we were younger, she's like, what are you going to shoot without a whale? I'm like, well, mate, if I have, if I have to, I mean, something, I can shoot anything with this thing. That fucker, you know? that fucker looks at me wrong. Dude. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Just joking. We don't shoot whales here. Just kidding. kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, so Jerry, what's, you know, any trips coming up next or what, what's next? Yeah. I'm going back to, uh, I'm going back to Africa this year, diving a whole nother location over there. But um, yeah, I'm just focused on a big doggy right now. I'm, my bucket list um, fish on that right now is like to try to get one over 200 pounds. And I'm going after that this year again. Not a boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> i cannot but, imagine i i cannot imagine. yeah so that's that's um i don't know like a lot of guys a lot of women are like everyone in this sport tends to have like this like really like intense strong like competitive edge which is absolutely amazing and um you know they all like are judging it by how deep they dive and how long they dive and how many tournaments they won or not but i don't know man i think there's like this like kind of like this benchmark of big trophy fish to get and I don't know many guys that's accomplished that big list of fish. And, you know, some of the, like some of my friends and I, um, Cam, myself, GR, Pete, like we start talking about like this, like list of big trophy fish. You and I have even talked about it a little bit. Like, right. so you, I mean, people like, Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've done everything I wanted to with spearfishing. I'm like, man, if you really like tighten up that list, man, that's a very, very special list of fish to get. And I don't even know if it can be accomplished in a lifetime to be perfectly honest with you. Well, give it, give people an idea of what we're talking about. As yeah. Well. So like, like, so in my mind, like a yellowfin tuna over 200 pounds, a bluefin tuna over 200 pounds, a doggy, ideally over 200, but 
hell, even a benchmark fish at 150 is an amazing accomplishment. Massive. And then you start getting in, and then you start getting into like the bigger reef species and like other pelagic species, right? So a big trophy yellowtail for you guys would be one over 50 pounds. Right. The guys in New Zealand would probably be one over like 80 pounds. Those are big fish. Like, but when you start breaking down the list of hunters and spear fishermen and spear fisher women for that matter, that started accomplishing like these really big, amazing fish, like that list gets really small. And then, then you go into the Wahoo at over a hundred and a Cabrera snapper over a hundred, a grouper over a hundred, you know, then you start talking like the white sea bass over 50 pounds. I feel like that's a very big trophy special fish. Like I, I reckon like that list of divers in California, that's got one over 50 is probably what 10% of y'all's divers or less. No, nah, probably a little bigger. I would say like 70 okay. would be like, Oh, that's a solid fish, man. It's a solid fish. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. So like that's what I said. And then, then when you go into the Florida waters, like, you know, a permit over 35, 40 pounds is a really trophy fish, a cobia over a hundred, an amberjack over a hundred. Like those are really big trophy fish. And I know a lot of guys that's gotten fish really close to that, but still doesn't really hit that benchmark. Right. I mean, I completely understand. Cause we were talking about that where it's like the older I get, I feel like I can only shoot so many 20 pound yellowtail 30, even 30 pound even like yellowtail for it doesn't have that significance that it should if i shoot sure. it it almost feels like it's disrespectful and somebody else on the boat would probably lose their shit if they shot it go for yeah. it yeah but um, yeah and uh, and like i said i I've, I've hit quite a few fish on my list but i'm missing a lot of fish too so right my, yeah. my doggy's my next one and i feel like um as I get looking forward to finding out myself. Well, when you do, let me know because we'll have you. Yeah, and, and like I said, I, I I feel like that fish is very special over 150, but I'm gonna I'm aiming high. No, I, I get it. Well, again, thank you, Jerry, for your time. Um, and thank you for uh trusting me with your brand and sponsoring the show as well. I yeah, take absolutely it lightly. Um, so is there anything uh where can we find you? Uh and all the good stuff for Neptonics. Yeah, man. So it's um neptonics.com and then our social media, um, our Instagram is at Neptonics Worldwide. And then um, my email is jerry at neptonics.com. Feel free to hit me up at any of those. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry, for everything you do, really for the community and provide good, no bullshit stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. My pleasure, man. And big thanks to you guys for like the podcast, man. It's really nice to see what you guys are doing and what Shrek is doing with the noob Spiro and like bringing like, I wouldn't, I don't know like the right term to use there or call it professionals for lack of a better term and bringing like a wealth of knowledge in there and actually letting people hear like stuff from their own ears and not just like trusting some bullshit off of Instagram or some <laughs> other, some, some, some fucking media forum that someone's never done. You know? Oh, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It, I always say beware of false prophets. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's always really interesting to me, man. Like how many guys will come in their shop saying like, I bought this off of a, you know, Facebook marketplace and this guy said he shot 50 fish with it. I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> not so sure this is going to work for your tuna trip, buddy. You might wound a lot. Or you might not even hit the fucking thing. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry, so much. Um, appreciate all your time. 